Welcome to the show. Today we're going to be discussing the Ouija board. The Ouija board has been around for centuries and its history is filled with mystery and intrigue. It has been used by people from all walks of life, from spiritualists to scientists, occultists, each one to explore the unknown. I'm trying to be objective when I'm looking at the Ouija board because I don't want to fall into the trap of being hoisted by my own fatard, as they say. So we're going to look at the whole process. We're going to listen to different people, what they think about it. We're going to listen to the scientific community, occultists, and hopefully we can come to a balanced opinion. How does one use the Ouija board? Well, the scrying procedure is carried out by using a square shaped board. On it are the letters of the alphabet and the numbers 1 to 10 and the word yes and no and goodbye. Participants place their fingertips on a triangle shaped pointer called a planchette, which moves around the board to spell out the alleged spirit's messages. Now, it's interestingly, it's always called a game. The Ouija game sales ominously peaked during times of crisis. For example, throughout World War I, England experienced a surge in the boards in an attempt for people to contact dead relatives and soldiers that they knew. So they all literally sat round in the house and started performing seances using the Ouija board. However, when did the Ouija board come into existence or come into being, so to speak? Well, there's a gentleman called Charles Kennard. He is widely credited as the inventor of the Ouija board. He was a business from Baltimore, USA, Maryland who founded the Kennard Novelty Company in 1890. His invention was inspired by spiritualism, namely the Fox Sisters, and his desire to create a tool to communicate with the spirits, obviously with a strong commercial angle. Um, In the old days, people used to pay to go to seances, and they were usually in the pitch black and... People used to knock, well, used to hear knocks. Is anybody there? Knock, knock, knock. Who, you know, uh, the medium would go into a trance. Uh, it would be your Aunt Ethel or Uncle Jack or whatever. However, the, the Ouija board allegedly took out the, the medium and took out the opportunity of being, well, scammed, really. Anyway, this is... This is probably uh, known by everybody. But who was Charles Kennard? Um, Was he an adept, a lifetime spiritualist, a cultist or Freemason? Neither. Charles Kennard was an entrepreneur, i.e. he was in it for the money. Um, He's not really the greatest or the luckiest businessman in the beginning of his career. He had several businesses that have failed. Moreover, it doesn't appear that he was the most honest trader either. Kennard moved to Maryland's eastern shore in the 1880s after developing a secret bone mix for recipe for fertilizer. Calling a fertilizer a secret recipe was the norm at the time. And having some initial success in his Chestersine plant, however... A combination of drought, competition and debt, and he went bust. However, all was not lost. A Persian immigrant called E.C. Reich, who kept an office next to Kennard's on the first floor, Story Wood Frome Hotel in Chester Times, tiny business district, a furniture maker turned coffin maker, kind of gelled with the entrepreneur and of course Kennard having an ear and somebody with money pitched the plan to get rich. Kennard's plan had been inspired by two generations earlier by a pair of girls I previously 
mentioned from upstate New York, named the Fox Sisters, who claimed to be mediums and able to interpret mysterious knocks from the other side. In reality, this, uh, this alleged ability launched the American spiritualist movement. After, after the aftermath of the Civil War, with so many fathers and sons, grandfathers and relatives lost in the conflicts, uh, horrific battles, spiritualism really surged in America. And the belief that the dead can speak to the living almost became the norm. Uh, really, it, it, people were desperate to speak with departed loved ones. And they wanted, to, you know, obviously, if you, if you can't see the person buried, if, you, if you've really no idea, you want closure. And the Ouija board helped people find this closure. Um, however, it was during this atmosphere of people wanting to communicate with the dead and wanting closure, etc., etc., Kennedy and Reich, who shared the business, began to notice newspaper reports concerning something called the talking board. Now, um, the talking board was not the Ouija board, it was something different. However, Kennard and Wright began collaborating and made at least a dozen of their own talking boards. Uh, Wright, though, was a little bit better at business. He'd become a successful coffee maker and making talking boards on the side was obviously a little, you know, was a good incentive. Um, there is a, a leading expert in America called Robert Murch. Um, he's a leading historian and authority on talking boards. And he claims that um, Reich and, well, Reich's design, I presume, and Kennard's ideal became the prototype for the Ouija board. Due to low sales of the talking board, Kennard left Chesterton for Baltimore in 1890, where he continued selling fertilizer. He also started a real estate business. It was during this time period that he began pitching his talking board invention to potential investors. After numerous rejections, which is pretty common for business, so, you know, however he stuck at it, Elijah Bond, a local attorney whose sister-in-law was a strong medium, finally took interest with new inspiration. The Kennard Novelty Company, which was founded the day before Halloween, no less, and began manufacturing Ouija board pretty much as they appear today. His business partner Bond's faith in his sister's, sister-in-law's ability proved to be well-founded. Helen Peters was convincing enough with Kennard's new talking board to win over a skeptical U.S. patent office. She not only gets credit for earning the stamp of legitimacy, from the American federal government certifying the board delivered as promised, but also for receiving the name Ouija from the board itself, which told her the strange word meant good luck. In truth, the name Ouija was written on the necklace locket that Peter was wearing at the time. Kennard's invention quickly gained popularity and became the sensation among spiritualists and paranormal enthusiasts alike. Charles Kennard played an important role in its development and popularization. From its conception in the 1890s to present day Ouija board, it is believed for communicating with spirits or other supernatural entities. It is said that when used correctly, it can provide answers about the past, the present and the future. However, is the Ouija board communicator something that contacts the dead or is it just a dark toy that exploits the grief and the gullible through self-hypnosis, false hope and the subconscious mind? Many scientists believe the power that moves the pointer is not the devil, the spirits or jinn. However, it does encode what the psychologists refer to as the deep subconscious. 
later coined as the zombie mind. The zombie mind is when you're driving, you you, you kind of go into a, a deep state where you where you you're driving automatically, you're changing gear, you're braking, but you're not really thinking about it. However, despite this label, academics believe this board reveals fascinating phenomena connected with the human psyche and behaviour. However, let us not discount unassisted clairvoyance that can be unnervingly accurate. In recent years, the Ouija board has provided psychologists with insights into the mind. Ironically, this mirrors an old advertisement from 1891 that states, for scientific or thoughtful, its mysterious movement invite the most careful research and investigation, apparently forming a link which unties the known with the unknown. Moving on, psychologists believe Ouija boards don't reveal much about disembodied spirits. However, they expose a great deal about our unconscious selves. When dealing with supernatural phenomena, it pays to be sceptical, both as a practitioner and a client. Psychologists believe the boards don't reveal much about disembodied spirits. However, they expose a great deal about our unconscious selves when dealing with supernatural phenomena. It pays to be sceptical both as a practitioner and a client in all psychic phenomena. Interestingly, uh, one of the uh, luminaries from this period was Harry Houdini. Now, Harry Houdini spent 30 years debunking mediumship and later on James Randi. They both believe that all spiritual communication to be bogus. Personally, as a practice occultist, when it comes to part of mediumship, the fable of the king wearing no clothes spring to mind. I believe there's an awful lot of, if you like, cold reading and mediums, some mediums, not all mediums, some are very unscrupulous. They go through the uh, birth of deaths. They live for death. And generally speaking, when somebody turns up, uh, they have no idea that they're dealing with somebody who knows a great deal more about their uh, relatives dying than could be imagined possible. Especially nowadays with the internet, you can get so much information that it's very possible to sort of mix the information you know with the cold reading and the person's going, wow, wow, that's amazing. I mean, this this technique has been used for thousands of years. Um, in the 90s, I was, no, early, sorry, 80s, in the 80s, I met a Indian professor who spoke pretty much all the languages in India, and the MI5 wanted him to investigate a famous guru, um, the guy is dead now, so I said probably I can mention him, which is Sai Baba, and the MI5 wanted to know how Sai Baba knew so much about the people he met because they were not convinced it was psychic phenomena. Anyway, the the professor uh, came to me and he said, you know, I need to look like uh, as what, what they call, you know, sort of like a, a wandering religious man, a, 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 a well, a kind of a, a they're a mixture between a, a hobo and somebody who is religious, a, a sadhu. Anyway, um, we, uh, I connected him. We made him look like nothing like a, a well-heeled professor who was at Hull University and uh, sent him on his way to India. He spent three months riding the trains, and I, I saw him when he came back. And the scam works like this, that the guys would pretend to be poor and put their hands out and ask for money, and they would pretend not to be able to speak English, and they would sit next to whoever was on the train. The person on the train would be talking about their lives, they would take notes. And when the and when the people went to sleep, they would go through their luggage 
they would get medical bottles, they would get everything. So when they went to meet Sai Baba, literally he had everything on them. And essentially, they fell for it hook, line and sin sinker. This con is still going on in India today. Quite often they'll meet a guru and the guru will say, last night you were thinking heavily about your mother. And they'll go, how do you know that? Well, essentially, there's, there's some little Indian sat in the, in, on the floor pretending to be poor, listening to every word that, that you're saying and watching everything that you do. Anyway, moving on. When one uses the planchette, there is some, something weird happens. There is a ghostly movement. Usually when, when, when people are playing with the Ouija board, they always accuse the other person of moving the planchette. But, but what causes this ghostly movement of the pointer or the glass or coin or whatever object happens to be used? For us to learn a possible answer, I want to really quote the ideas of Chris French, a professor of psychology at the Goldsmiths University of London. He spent decades studying the science behind supernatural experiences, but his first brush with the Ouija board came when he was an undergrad. French is quoted, um, it used to be a regular Friday night of entertainment for me, he recalls. He and his friends made their own Ouija board by writing the alphabet on a piece of paper using an upturned wine glass as a planchette. I don't think any of us really believed that we were communicating with the spirits, but it was great fun. French recalls the way the wine glass really felt like it was moving itself. Whenever I've, I've, I've played with the Ouija board, there, there is, it certainly feels like it moves by its self um the you know french went on to say that the illusion that it's moving on its own is incredibly strong and i will agree with that it is incredibly strong uh, however he says he and his friends were simply experiencing a long known phenomena called the eye demoter effect um magicians will use the eye demoter effect essentially um these so-called mind readers look for the tiniest subconscious movement and from that they can they can read pr pretty accurately what a person is thinking about or where something is hidden uh, uh, quite a lot of fake mediums use the same thing they may use it out of consciousness or, or in consciousness i i don't know but essentially the the best mediums that i know um tend to be hyper vigilant meaning they can literally notice everything about a person however regardless of the idemotor effect or the deep conscious mind if you want to call it that i wanted to collect an academic study on the effects of mediumship and the ouija board studied by people who are aware of this phenomena and who were trained in critical thinking it's very difficult to find nowadays a, a study because quite simply um, Big Pharma is, is, is not really interested in looking at this phenomena. But I did find one um, by Gene M. Merrick. Uh, his, his academic study is called Beliefs and Customs Surrounding Mediumship and the Ouija Board. Uh, it was it was written in 1999 for St. John's, Newfoundland in Canada. Now, interestingly, he went back in history and he found a study on the famous Fox sisters medium who inspired the inventor of the Ouija board, Canard. Their medium skills were observed by the equally famous scientist Faraday, who surmised the table wrapping sounds had been caused by body movements altered their body posture, all the table noises ceased. The report noted that the, the Fox sisters held a genuine surprise to their subconsciously creating the wrapping. However, this did not put anybody off going to spiritual seances involving communication with the dead viable tail bill wrapping, and it hasn't ceased since Faraday's findings. Study two is far more interesting. Uh, this was round about the end of the Civil War, and it was held by 
a guy called Sir William Francis Barrett, no relation. He blindfolded Ouija board sitters and turned the boards around. So he turned the boards upside down. Barrett also placed an opaque screen above the sitter's hand. So they had a they had a blindfold on and there was also a board over their hands. However, sorry, accurately recorded records of messages came through from many spirits. The test lasted over a period of 20 years. Of one of the most convincing tests that I read was a message received from a Civil War dead army captain whose belongings were found through the board and were sent home months later after the Ouija board session. Moreover, the unusual name of his fiancée on the tie pin had the same spelling recorded by the board. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things there which makes me think that it can't be coincidence because the board found his possession, the board spelt the fiancé's name correctly, even though it was a very strange spelling. Uh, Sir Barrett declared, whatever may be the source of the intelligence displayed, it was absolutely beyond the range of human facility. The book title of the 20-year-old study is called On the Threshold of the Unseen, so if you like to read old books, I would definitely recommend it. Dr. Ronald Reinsick, Associate Professor of Emirates Computer Science and Psychology at the University of British Columbia, has used the Ouija board as part of his research and was recently part of a story published in Discover magazine about the project. Dr. Rensick and his colleagues, Dr. Helene L. Gaucho from the UBS Psychology and Dr. Sid Fields from UB Electrical and Computer Engineering, conducted their research and paper in 2012. The methodology used in their study proves insight into the unconscious mind and hypothesis. That is an unconscious level that we know more than we think. People in, under hypnosis often recall things that they have forgotten. So, you know, I think there's a lot of credibility with that statement. In the study, they investigate the question of whether the eye motor actions and conscious movements can also express non-conscious knowledge. The team did this by using a method that drew in the participants' implicit or non-conscious long-term semestic memory, which is not available for the conscious to record. Ronald and his team were curious to learn what was going on with the people who were in the what they consider the zombie state of mind. He commented, although you're driving non-consciously, you don't drive off the road or into other vehicles, he said. So how are you doing this? We began to wonder if we could test the capability of this zombie state by using the Ouija. The results of the 2012 study show that implicit Thematic memory can be expressed through the eye motor actions. This, this is the moments of the pointers that can be often come from information stored at a non-conscious level, a level not always accessible to the conscious mind. This could be very important for other applications, according to Ronald. I think one of the many potential opportunities to use the zombie mind for therapy, it might be along the same vein as hypnosis. Dr. Reinsick's studies does not explain demonic possession suffered by the Ouija board practitioners. You can see this on YouTube, you often see it in documentaries. Don't play with the Ouija board, you will become possessed. So I looked at this study. Um, psychologist today, Robert Bartholomew, PhD, wrote, this, wrote about this phenomena in his article he stated there's been several reports of Ouija boards triggering demonic possession, either in individuals or small groups. The players, usually students, were reported to have fallen into a trance and appeared to be possessed by spirits. Possession states are well known to psychiatrists. Uh, we all have possessed traits, so to speak. For example, a, a very simple possession trait is the, the phone. There are teenagers who cannot leave the phone alone. There are some adults who cannot leave the phone alone. There are some adults who can't leave the computer alone. You know, so you know, we have to be very careful what we understand is possession. 
you know i mean there are you know sort of there are, the possession is is a strange one but 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 this in particular what the guy is studying is demonic possession okay um he was saying that the, these states of mind can be triggered by extreme stress in suspect, susceptible individuals. Well, having lived through the uh, the COOF crisis, I think there's more susceptible individuals than you can imagine because everybody followed blindly down the path of wearing masks, getting the vaccine, etc., etc. And to me, it showed how susceptible people are to any form of mind control. However, there's a widespread belief in many cultures that people can, can contact the spirit of the dead or demonic entities by using an Ouija board. Now, the other thing as well is, is, is these studies are okay, but, but as an occultist, I understand and have seen examples of unexplainable spirit phenomena. For example, uh, within voodoo, there's large fetishes that come to life and spin, and there is nobody inside these fetishes. And you can see it on YouTube, and it's been investigated. Literally, these large fetishes come to life and they spin round like they have people inside of them and they turn them upside down and there is nothing in them so uh it could be a very very clever magic trick or there is some kind of energy which is accessed so but anyway over the years people have been complaining of being demonically possessed because of the ouija board in November 2014, 35 students at St. Cruz in Dilla, Sierra Bolivia, were taken to hospital treatment after playing with the Ouija board, known locally as the Cup Game. They were reportedly suffering from mental agitation and confusion, profound sweating, rapid pulses and trans states. Over the past years, many countries in South America and Central America have been hotspots for the game. And there are many reports of mass faintings and spirit possessions, especially in Mexico. The largest outbreak of illness attributed to an Ouija board took place in October 2006 and June 2007 at a girls-only Catholic boarding school near Mexico City. Students at the girls' town school reported a variety of symptoms, including headaches, difficulty walking, Students could only walk with the help of their friends. Symptoms would suddenly go away and then return. Of a student population of 4,512 were affected. So it wasn't exactly a mass outbreak. Mexican psychiatrist uh, Lola Zavala investigated the outbreak and diagnosed this as a case of mass psych psychogenic illness, aka mass hysteria, and traced it back to a student who had used an Ouija board to try and influence the outcome of a school basketball game. Writing in a 2010 issue of the International Journal of Psychoanalysis, she noticed that the accused girl Maria was expelled for using the board, but after leaving, she was reported to have cursed the school. Soon after the symptoms appeared, a belief in the reality of demons and cursing and the and the involvement of the Ouija board and rumours that Maria's mother was a witch seems to have generated all the stress. Dr Zavala observed that even before the outbreak, the school was a hotbed of tension as it operated under strict rules where even minor infractions could result in dismissal. The first few victims of the strange malady only affected Maria's fellow Ouija board players but soon spread across the school. There was uh, a much there was a thing in the nineties where there was um, a, a remembrance board on a website, and if 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 a child died, their name was put on the website. And ironically, children started committing suicide so they could be on the website. So, you know, if somebody's committed to something it, and the mind can do the rest, so to speak. Robert Bartholomew, PhD, concluded that this report and writing, there is no scientific evidence that Ouija boards can contact the spirit or that such a world even exists, but the participants believe they do. 
The anxiety of believing that they are contacting the spirits or demon can be overwhelming for some triggering trans states and even episodes where people may hallucinate and lose touch with reality. I think we should remember that the psychological profession is based on the scientific premise that the science only understands 10% of the brain. Correspondingly, luminaries in the field of psychiatry, such as Jung, related the mind to academic principles as demonstrated with his work. However, he also promoted alchemaic principles in works such as the Red Book. One must remember that modern day psychiatry and psychologist remedies rely on addictive pills that block symptoms as opposed to cure. So when somebody is allegedly hearing voices or they're being affected by something, they're giving a pill which stops the voices. However, these pills are generally um, very addictive and they're also mind altering. So, so the, the whole personality of the person changes. But this is where they make their money. So if you're selling pills, you may not want to believe in the spirit world, but you may want to believe in your pills, so to speak. And I think that's the that's where the scepticism concerning occult phenomena really lies. However, quantum science is leaning more and more towards Eastern mysticism. Uh, for example, outside CERN, there is a picture, sorry, not a picture, there is a statue of Shiva. But uh, so I decided to contact some high profile cultists that I know who have used the Ouija board. Now, interestingly, Thomas Sheridan, um, who uh, does a great deal of study, and he, also, he did a program condemning the use of what he sees as a dangerous vortex to unseen worlds. So I, I contacted some several high-ranking Slavic witches that I know who do many rituals that involve speaking to the dead relatives, and they don't use the board for precisely the same reason as Sheridan. I also have a life time practicing witch friend for over 40 years, Samantha, who agrees with the, her sister witches and Sheridan, adding the Ouija board is a spirit world's yellow pages with the names blocked out. You never know whom you're going to connect with. Olga, a Slavist witch who has been on my channel several times, uses the pendulum and protection rituals before any necromancy. However, the master black magician, who's a friend, J.S. Garrett, I spoke to him, he tried the Ouija board and didn't get any results from it at all. However, I know he uses protective spirits and that could account for why there was no contact. I myself has had good and bad experiences with the board. Um, I had one in my house and it was, to tell you the truth, um, uh, when I was younger, uh, I'd opened a board up. I, I was a younger cultist and realistically, Back in the 70s, there was very little information about occultism. Um, it, it was very difficult to find anything of any credibility. And quite simply, I, I didn't know about the lesser banishing ritual. I didn't know about closing and opening. And by some kind of freakish luck, I'd managed to open some kind of portal. In my room, there was like cups moving around, doors slamming. I was terrified that my mother would find out, so I, I got rid of the thing. I think I threw it out, in, in all honesty. I agree with uh, Sheridan, Samantha, and the Slavic witches. I liken the Ouija board to alighting at King's Cross in London, showing all your credit cards and money, and asking unknown people to help you or be your friends. I wouldn't advise that on any level. In the same way, I wouldn't advise... Um, necromancy with the Ouija board, especially if you have clairvoyant talent. Uh, interestingly, uh, I spoke to um, another friend, Chris, Chris Hart. She's she's never used one either. To finalise, when I was when I was sort of a little bit older, I was rung by a friend who was at a party. Uh, I said, uh, "What's the matter?" and he. He begged me to come to the house. I said, I said why? They said, oh, after the party, we we got the Ouija board out. I said, oh, yeah. And uh, they were all terrified. 
I, I drove to the party about 10 miles away. And when I got there, the, the hostess was literally on the floor, crying her eyes out. Literally tears were pouring down, the, down her eyes. And the guests had left the room and all was there was my friend and the and the room itself that nobody dare go into. I went into the room. It, it felt like you were walking through cobwebs. It smelled absolutely disgusting. And there was a really oppressive atmosphere. You, you could almost cut the atmosphere with a, with a knife. Uh, it took me over an hour to get rid of the presence. Uh, there was something definitely there. However, um, my mentor and high-ranking Freemason, who I will call Master C, does not use the board. And if he performs any necromancy, he uses the rituals such as the lesser banishing rituals before he starts. Yeah. However, I would like to finish by saying that I do believe in alternative words and visitors from these places in the same way as Steiner, Blavatsky and Jung. Moreover, in this century, the CIA investigated the gateway experience. Now, the gateway experience uses binaural beats. And their conclusion was, was the gateway experience is a process that is beyond hypnosis and transistor meditation and biofeedback. It requires achieving a state of high consciousness in which the electrical brain patterns of both hemis hemispheres are equal in ampl amplitude and frequency. This is called hemisync. Um, lamentally, and perhaps conveniently, we cannot as humans achieve this state on our own. According to the CIA, this technique alters consciousness and ultimately allows the practitioner to escape space-time and communicate with entities from other dimensions and visit worlds. I would like to add that I believe a lot of psychological research into the occult phenomenon, such as theurgy, divination, is heavily influenced by the church, even in the 21st century. It's very interesting that the teachers of Jesus, or Isha, whatever you want to call him, found in the Gospel of St. Thomas, clearly state that the kingdom of God is within. And, and these... This is wholeheartedly rejected by Abrahamic religions. So th there is this real dual standard. The congregation is not allowed to practice magic. However, the imams, the priests, they all practice magic. Yeah, if you ever go to a Catholic mass, essentially the Catholic mass is a pure magic ritual. Um, when the imams do the exorcisms to get rid of jinns, that itself is a magical ritual. It's, it, it, without wanting to harp on me, it reminds me again of the masks. The elite didn't wear the masks, the people had to wear the masks, you know, sort of in much the same way the people are not allowed to, uh, to use any form of meditation or magic, yet the priests and the imams and the rabbis, they can all do this. So having researched in a really thorough manner, the exact origin of the, Ju of the Ouija board is dubious. It's not purely Kenneth. Some researchers believe it was invented in ancient China or Egypt to communicate with the dead. Other thinks it was created in America during the 19th century prior to Kennedy. However, whatever its origin may be, one thing is certain. The Ouija board continues to fascinate people today and remains an important part of our magical cultural heritage. Jin Illuminated is a new book by Brian Barot. It's the result of a lifetime study in occultism. Barot has worked with adepts in India, Africa and the Yemen. This book allows the reader access to the Jin. Everything within its pages is authentic. This book has been reviewed by occultists such as J.S. Garrett who believes it's one of the best books ever written on the subject of jinn. It's also been reviewed by Sufi masters, namely German Kuwaito Myers, 
who believes this is a really good book. Moreover, Christine Hart, Sunday Times best-selling author, she writes, this book is wonderful, a glorious read. It's not for nothing. Brian Barrett has been called the gin master. If you want fame, if you want a better relationship, if you want spiritual awakening, Gin Illuminated is available on Kindle.